Good evening, BSKL. Hello. Got six people now waiting. Uh, thought I'd go live. We are dead on seven o'clock. Today, we're going to be running through our group one topic, which is the first topic on my list of five to be going through with you guys because of your mock paper and how terrible your answers were for the group ones. And so I figured that it's worthwhile. We're going to be doing five sessions in total. And we're going to start reading my email. Please make sure if you're not sure about when the other ones are, please make sure you go back and watch them. Or at least make sure you log when they're going to be. <clears throat> cool. So, right. So first of all, folks, I need to try and make sure that my internet connections here is as good as possible. I'm trying to make sure that it is. I'm not sure what my, my I've got my laptop going side by side. I need to try and make sure that I'm not taking up as much of my bandwidth as I can. But I have already posted on the chat, on the YouTube chat, I've just posted a YouTube link. And this is for the video that you guys need to watch that goes along with today, tonight's session. So, cool. Hey, Johan, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. So, what I've done is today, I'm going to be looking at group one revision. I'm going to add that to the notes really quickly. Group one, and I'm going to be covering in this session, I'm gonna be going super quick. This is gonna be crash course in alkali metals. So I'm gonna be doing atomic structure and bonding, then dropping straight into properties, then dropping straight into reactions, and these are the reactions that are commonly asked. Uh, hi, Donna, hi, Yi, thanks for coming, appreciate it. And yeah, these are the three, these here, are the three common reactions that are discussed in exams. And then I'm gonna go straight through the preliminary work that I set you guys for this, because um, I thought there were some lovely questions on there. Okay. Hey, Ben, hey, Winkit. Uh, hey, Amira, thanks for coming. <laughs> okay. So what I'm gonna first of all do is, I'm, this is gonna be a really quick, really, really quick paced uh, session. I'm gonna try and do it in under an hour. So going to my Google Hangouts, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so I'm going to drop you guys out from being able to see me now. I've got Mo. I like it. We've got 10 people now on the watch. I like it. 10 out of 60. We need to work on this, guys. Seriously need to work at this. I need more. I need more people to sign up for the channel. I need, I need everybody here getting involved. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. And then I'm going to drop into this bit. I'm going to do my best. I think if I close that one down, I'm trying to kind of crank up my laptop to be as fast as possible so that I've got as little lag. Cool. So you guys should now be able to see the screen that I'm looking at. And as I said at the start of this, I've just said to you guys what I'm going to be doing in this session. So I'm going to be doing atomic structure, bonding, properties, reactions, water demo, chlorine demo, and oxygen demo. At the very beginning, guys, of this chat, there is a YouTube link. And that's the video of me doing all of these demonstrations in nine minutes with all the observations that go with it. So what I'd actually like you to do is if you can open that up, perhaps, as a second window, that might be quite useful. But I'm still working on this. There's still um, time to improve. I'm hoping that I'm going to switch to a different piece of software next time. Thanks for coming, Daniel. Nice to see you, George. Numbers increasing, we're now up to 13 watches. Woo! Come on. Okay, right. So straight away, I'm dropping into atomic structure. So we know that as we go down our group ones, we know that atoms get bigger. So we've got, got lithium there with our three shells. We've got our two comma one. It's nice to see our electronic structure. First shell holding two, Third, uh, the second shell got one in it. Second, of course, is sodium-281, uh, appearing to see our shells. The atoms are getting larger. And, of course, potassium finishing there at 2881. Now, we tend to finish there, of course, with group one, just because once we pass 2881, then you're outside the GCSE remit of being able to quote their electron configurations. So it's nice to end there, but it is also nice to add on that we've got rubidium and we've got cesium below this. There is also francium, FR. Please do not talk about him. The reason being is francium is a radioactive element. There's hardly any of it on the planet, less than two grams. And so I really need you guys to make sure that you're never talking about francium if it ever makes an appearance. 
We don't even know technically what it looks like. We've never actually extracted enough of it. It's lovely at me to, at this point just to also comment on the reactivity series. We know that the reactivity series helps us to be able to define how the metals are being extracted from their oxides. Now, because these are all above carbon in the reactivity series, this is where I really need to get on my reactivity series, which would be incredibly useful. Let's see if I can manage to get up the reactivity on my screen. Oh, I don't want that one. I want, do you know what? I want a completely new tab. I have no idea how to do this with my pen. Oh, Google Chrome. Yeah, I like it. Let's see if we can get up the reactivity series onto here. Reactivity series. There we go. And of course, this image comes from year eight chemistry. And by the way, at this point, it's nice to see that carbon appearing. I hate that reactivity series. It's horrible. That one's better. And our group ones are way above carbon. So they're going to be all extracted by electrolysis. None of them can be reduced using carbon as our reducing agent. Okay, next one. So now that we've discussed the atoms and we've commented on size, the size of these is getting larger. Size is increasing. I get to drop in to doing a little bit of bonding. Now, this, of course, for any year 10s that are taking part in this particular webinar, you guys are now not going to be up to date with our bonding, but I grabbed myself a picture of metallic bonding. So we know that metallic bonding metals, and of course, it's metallic is the bond type. And what we do is if we ever run Susan Boyle's Sings Nelly the Elephant, Susan Boyle sings Nelly the Elephant to explain high melting point. We've got structure, a giant metallic lattice. It is the bonds are the electrostatic, the electstat between. Now, this is where it differs from ionic. Electrostatic attraction between the lattice of cations. The word lattice means organized layers, organized structure. So we've got the lattice of cations surrounded by the sea of delocalized electrons. And of course, that there is a super important one when it comes into doing Susan Boyle for our melting point, because that, that requires a huge description. Strength, of course, is strong. All electrostatics are. Number, millions, because we're in a giant structure. And the energy, of course, is going to be high. So it's nice to talk about it. But then, of course, we get to compare them on our metals. Now, as we move from lithium to sodium to potassium, there is a very subtle change in the diagram. The reason is the size. So if I just do a really quick sketch, I have got lithiums, they're all plus ones, and they all have lost one electron to the sea of delocalized electrons. So these, of course, I'm, I've, I've added too many now, I need six because there are six ions in my picture. So this is a strong metallic, it's a giant metallic lattice, cations, sea of delocalized electrons, and plus one cations, and one electron in the delocalized sea per ion. Then we get to sodium and the ions are larger. So now because the ions are larger, that was a terrible, I've really not done a great job. There we go, it's a better one than the second one. So now I've got the same six ions, the same six electrons, but now the cations are larger. What that means is I have got the same strength electrostatic attraction between the sea of delocalized electrons and the lattice of cations, but that force is having to hold together larger ions. This means that the electrostatic attraction will be weaker. So if you get asked the question, the question of compare, compare the melting points of lithium and sodium, we're going to compare those guys, then we realize that sodium is going to have the lower boiling point, and they're going to have, so Na, lower BPT, lower boiling point and melting point, melting point much more likely to be discussed, in fact, let's drop into MPT, the reason being the sodium cations, please notice the use of cations, not atoms, but we're going to have sodium cations are larger than lithiums, than Li, than Li1 plus cations. Therefore, weaker, weaker electstat, electrostatic attraction. So, and that's as all it needs to go. And, and that question is much more A-level than GCSE. They never usually compare plus ones to each other because you don't really come across the size, size all that much. Um, do you retract? I didn't know what what it would do is mine retract 
Did you just retract a statement? No, I don't. Oh, somebody did. Johan's just deleted message retracted. Not me. Okay. Right. On to potassium. Potassium again. Even larger cations. Same positive charge. Same number of electrons in the delocalized C. Weaker electrostatic attraction seen in the metal. So the melting point is going to drop again. Melting point of lithium runs about 180. Melting point of sodium runs about 120. Melting point of potassium is around about 98. So they're dropping massively as we move down purely because the ions are getting larger. So, okay, so we've discussed this idea of metallic bonding, and this has a direct impact on the melting point, but also one of the other properties that we then drop into. So we've talked about atomic structure. They're getting larger. We're adding shells. The bonding is very similar, though, and we then talked about metallic bonding and how they differ down the group. Now we need to link this straight to the properties. So we know that there are several key properties that we see for, the for these group one metals. Now, I grabbed a, a picture of the group ones so we can see lithium, sodium, potassium, and every single one of them is stored in oil. This is important, year 11. All of these metals are stored in oil. Just to actually point out, by the way, rubidium is also stored in oil. Cesium, however, is not. Cesium has got to the point where it's so reactive, you're unable to even store it in oil. You have to then store it in a noble gas atmosphere. Hence why you very, very, very rarely see cesium metal. See, by the way, melting point again is still decreasing. Rubidium hits around about 60 degrees and uh, cesium runs around about 25 degrees. And that's actually almost a liquid at room temperature at that point. So just know the melting point trend. You need to know the melting point trend. Um, Tay, uh, Dixon, not sure which one. Uh, you need to know the melting point trend. You need to know the atomic radius, the, the atom size trend. And you need to know the reactivity trend and you're done. So these are all of these guys are stored in oil. And of course, the question, they're always going to ask this. Q, why store in oil? And this is usually a two mark question. And the reason being, of course, is you're wanting to say, answer is they're going to react um they're going to react with both uh react with both oxygen in the atmosphere so you, you can say air at gcsc but i prefer you to say oxygen in the atmosphere it's a better answer much better quality so react with o2 in air but also they will also react with the h2o that's in the air as well two reasons why we must store these in oil Okay, the next thing is to see that they're all metallic solids. These are solids as we move down. That's because the melting point is all above room temperature. So these are all solids at room temperature. Um, you can see that they do differ in color, but you would describe them as silver and shiny, all of them. Now, we're going to drop into the properties at this point. So key properties of these metals are the fact that you're now... Now, by the way, somebody is amazing. Have you remembered reactivity? Right, so we're going to talk about the properties of these metals. So the properties, the key ones, properties... We're going to be talking about number one is we're going to talk about their melting points and boiling points, but we've already got it. We realized, capital M, um, we realized that they're decreasing down the group. Next property we're going to talk about is their softness. Now, I know that's a ridiculous one to mention here, but their softness is directly related to their melting points. If you lower some, your melting point, you're going to become more soft. And this has an implication to when you see it being done as a, as a practical when you're actually cutting them. When you're cutting lithium metal, it feels like you're cutting, and I mentioned this in the video that you guys are going to watch probably at a later date, um, but we, we, when you cut it, when you're cutting sodium metal, it feels like you're cutting like a really hard plasticine, or like, um, I wouldn't say chocolate. Chocolate's actually tougher. Chocolate that had been left out on the surface, perhaps, but it's still relatively tough, but you can cut it with a knife. When you get to sodium, it's like cutting butter. When you get to potassium, there's really almost no resistance at all. It's like cutting something that would be a bit like jelly. There's hardly any resistance at all. So these are the two main. Now, just to note, these are the physical properties, physical props, rather than the chemical properties. Many people don't often realize the difference between chemical and physical, and these are, do need to be clear for group one. Okay, so now that we've covered the major two properties that we see uh, and that are seen in questions, we now need to talk about them in terms of their reactions. Now, this is where I'd really like for you guys, um, this is where I'd really love you guys to see the videos that I've posted. Uh, I've posted it, I've just, I've uploaded it this evening. Uh, the reason I was going to watch it uh, on and try and share my screen with you guys, but I realized when I did that, the quality was so poor that it really, 
really made it impossible for me to do that. So I uploaded it onto YouTube uh, in advance. That way you guys can watch this and be able to see what I've done. Now I have done the three major, major um, demonstrations, which is cutting all the group one metals, followed by the reactivity with water, followed by the reactivity with oxygen. And the key things, of course, um, are recognizing those observations. So what I'm gonna try and do is, I'm going to talk you through the demonstrations that are in that video, but I really would like, um, I, I'm just gonna show, I'm just gonna go back to, to this, and I'm gonna go to my YouTube um, uh, connection on my tablet. I'm just gonna quickly find you my video. I just want to show you where this is. So, and I put the link in the chat. I'm gonna post the link again, just for those people, control V, that didn't work, command V. There we go. There's the YouTube link again. Now I've just brought this up onto my reaction, uh, onto my tablet and you can see my posters there. There it is, public's gone on. Uh, views, it's already got 12 views. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how that's happened, but it's there. I'm hoping that that's gonna be you guys. So if you go onto that, if you use the link I've just given you, you'll get this, you'll get this video. Yes, that's a terrible te thumbnail. Oh, I need a better thumbnail. Oh, I can do that. Didn't even know I could do that. Let's see if I can do that one. Say, winner. That's a better picture of me rather than me with my mouth open. So, okay, that video goes through all of the demonstrations. Cutting, water, plus indicators followed by the reactions with oxygen. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to attempt to talk you through those. Okay, so first one is the reactions with water. So I'm going to zoom into, that's the one. Okay, so let's do reaction with water. So... And this, of course, is going to be the number one. And you'll notice that I drop into H2O. I am going to include a state symbol at that point. Um, no, we are watching the video. Okay, so we've got the reaction with water. So the first thing to realize is that they are all very different when you put them into water. And I mean very different. I'm going to attempt to do a really, really scrappy diagram of the differences between them because they are very different. So when I put lithium into water, now, lithium, of course, is a relatively tough metal, melting point around about 180. And when you put lithium into water, you see the fizzing that you get from all the metals, but it doesn't melt. This metal having a melting point that is in, in oh, nearly 200, it doesn't melt the way that the others do, and it doesn't form a sphere. It does float on the surface. This is the most, it does float. Uh, it does produce fizzing. Please do not say giving off gas. We know this already. Yeah, but those are the major two that we're going to see for lithium. Now, the next one, when you drop to, to sodium, we're now dropping down the group and we're increasing in reactivity. Now, of course, that requires an explanation, and they're going to ask this, folks. So we need to explain now reactivity. And there, let's, let's put it in terms of a question. We're going to have, here's my question, so we compare, compare reactivity, compare reactivity, of lithium and sodium. Let's just do those two. Okay, so we know that the sodium is gonna be more reactive. We know that as we go down the group, we go lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium. As we move down the group, the reactivity increases. We now need to explain this, and it again comes back to our size and where the electrons are and what they're doing. So we know that both, the lith both lithium and sodium are going to lose electrons. We know this, metals always lose electrons. This is just something metals do. They do not gain them, they lose them. Now, now we need to comment on their size. We know that lithium is a smaller atom, I'm just gonna pop on its outermost electron, in comparisons to sodium. That's gonna get you your first mark. Now, although you've said that they're gonna both lose electrons, it's the size that's going to be the first one, but talking through a story in chemistry is beneficial in terms of your understanding. You don't just want to be learning bullet points. You want to be able to think through a nice logical system for you to be, make it easier for you to remember it. So when you've got, they've got different sizes. So we've got sodium being larger. And again, by the way, please note, it's a comparison. It's larger compared to, lith compared to lithium. This means, by the way, it's nice for us to quote electron configurations. Lithium would be quoted as floating and fizzing. Yes, that is absolutely correct. Um, time to... No, we were watching... Yeah. So what uh, all the rest? I know quite. We're at 16. We'll see. It'll increase. So, okay. When the lithium goes into water, we're going to see it fizz. The sodium water, we're going to see. Now, the next thing for me to mention is violence. People like to comment on sodium's going to be more of a violent reaction. This is actually something you're not allowed to do in your exam. 
The reason being is that this is a qualitative judgment and it actually depends very much on the quantity of the metal that you put into the water. And so whenever they say small pieces, you don't want to be commenting on this violent reaction unless the question specifically puts you in that situation. So lithium and sodium in size comparison, sodium's larger. So the outer, let's just quote their electron configurations, 2,1 for lithium and 2,8,1 for sodium. Sodium's outermost electron, sodium's outermost electron is further, is further from the nucleus. Now, because it's further from the nucleus, don't know why I capitalized that, I shouldn't have, but it's further from the nucleus, therefore it's going to have a weaker attraction to it. And therefore, because it's further away, more easily lost. And that's your final mark. So we've got four clear marks here on this, this exam question. Four clear marks. And if they say this question and they ask you for three of them, you don't know which one they're going to discount. So give the lot. They cannot penalize you for giving you for giving more and good chemistry in these answers. We're talking about the losing electrons is definitely not going to be a mark. We're talking about size. We're giving their electron configurations. We're commenting on the distance that the electrons are from the nucleus. And we're saying that the sodium is going to be more easily lost. So that's our reactivity and how we compare them. You can do this, by the way, of course, if you compare the lithium to potassium, the answer is identical. They can reverse it. If they decide to do potassium to lithium, then you're saying that lithium is smaller, the electron closer to the nucleus, attraction is greater, more difficult to lose, so lower in reactivity. So when you put lithium into water, it floats and fizzes, but it does not melt. When you put sodium into water, now the reaction is produces a much higher temperature, and the sodium at this point melts, and it will form a sphere. And these, by the way, both of these are two distinct marking points. You can say melts, and you can say forms a sphere. Both of these observations are correct. So you can give either one of them, you can do them individually. I tend to include them both together. I don't like quoting them separately. I feel like they're part and parcel of the same thing, and so I like to include them uh, uh, together. Uh, and there's plenty more observations to give anyway. But this one's going to melt. Now, the next one is we're also going to see fizzing. This is another observation. Now, here's the next bit. Now, at this point, I am going to quickly go back to the Internet. The reason being is if I now Google, if I now Google, and this is the Internet is a wonderful resource um, in terms of chemistry. However, there is some really, really bad chemistry out there, folks. And this is the first one. So when you Google sodium and water, the first thing that everyone sees are explosions, fires, flames, which is a nightmare. Um, I've got Tay saying, they both lose electrons. Potassium is bigger than lithium. The outermost electron is further, further away. Further away is ambiguous. You'd always want to say further from the nucleus. So it is easily, so by the way, you're doing a comparative there, Tay. Uh, and by the way, Tay, is that the name you want me to call you or Dick, Dickin, or uh, Dixon? Don't know which one you want me to do, but I'm just gonna call you Tay for now. But it's a comparison. So all was good up to the point where you said the outermost electron of potassium is further away. You need to be more clear. Further away from what? You need to be saying further away from the nucleus. Uh, Dixon. Okay, Dixon, no problem. So Dixon, you want to be saying further away from the nucleus and is therefore more easily lost. If you just say, so it is easily lost, you lose the comparison and you'll lose those last two marks. The away, they'd probably be generous and give you the away mark. But you definitely want to include nucleus and you need to say more easily compared to lithium. So those subtleties and those words, that's exam practice. And often where you 11s, when you do those practice exams and you'll give yourself that mark when you really shouldn't get it. Be really, really clear with your chemistry. Chemistry is actually easier if you give more detail because it makes a lot more sense. Um, it's not that it's further away. It's that K is more unstable. No, that's not true. Now, the, the word unstable is really, really complicated, uh, BWIF, really complicated. Now, yes, you, you could probably describe potassium as being more unstable, but the problem is both of them are metals, and at room temperature, they're stable. So the word unstable is not good chemistry. Um, you, you, they are more reactive when put in a reaction setting. Don't use the word unstable. In fact, there is no part in... GCSE chemistry where you will use the words unstable ever. So in fact, completely delete it from your vocabulary for GCSE.
In fact, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, um, you, you could talk about their electron configuration being more stable or less stable. Don't say the word unstable. That's not a good word. So less stable, K is, is, is less stable, maybe, but in this setting, stay clear of it. You'll never use that at GCSE. Cool. By the way, um, that was a really lovely addition that to the post. So thank you for that. Really liked it. So when I look at those images on Google, that's, that's my problem I have. Yes, less stable is better, but please don't use it. Stick with more reactive and put it in a setting with water or oxygen. Um, and when you see these pictures, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pick on one. That there, it, for me, is a nightmare. Because sodium, actually, when you use a small piece, does not catch fire. It doesn't. It'll, what If you watch my video, it doesn't give you any sparks. It gives you no flames. You see no yellow, yellow light being given off. None of that is seen. It's only seen. In order to get sodium to do that, you have got to put in serious amounts of sodium. Like a piece you're talking about, um, bigger than a centimeter. And you're, you're not just going to be seeing a flame there. You're going to be seeing an explosion. It's going to blow up your, your beaker. That is not good chemistry, chemistry. So for sodium, going back to my picture, you see it fizz. Look at the differences. You see, you see it fizz. That's the same as lithium. Same one, fizzing, same as lithium. It, we see it float, same as lithium. And then we now see our two differences, more reactive and water, with water or oxygen. It's more reactive with both of them, in fact. It will give off a higher enthalpy change. It'll be more exothermic in both settings, BWIF. So then you see the differences between sodium and lithium. It will form the sphere and it will melt. Please note, please, please, there are no sparks. Mm, there are no sparks, yes? There is no flame. We see neither of these with sodium because we're putting in very small quantities. Do not comment with those for sodium. They are incorrect. We then drop into, we drop, drop into potassium. Now, potassium instantaneously does exactly the same thing that sodium does. It will form a sphere. We, it, will, it will fizz violently or instantaneously hear it. It'll be psh, and at that point, you're going to see sparks. And we're going to be seeing our sparks being spat out in our lilac color. It is not, we're going to be, oh, I don't like that. We're going to see, we're going to be seeing sparks spat out of this. And then we're going to be seeing a beautiful lilac flame coming through here. There we go. So we see the sparks. Here are our sparks. Ah, oh, it's not what I wanted. Here are our sparks. These are sparky bits. That's that's a technical term. Um, and then we see our beautiful lilac flame on the surface. Please don't call it purple. Um, effervescence is released. Oh, God, that's really funny. Right. Uh, Dixon, the word effervescence means fizzing. It doesn't mean so you can't actually say effervescence is released. That's not correct. You'd say it effervesces, or there is, or you can see effervescence, but you can't release fizzing. You see fizzing, you release a gas. Remember, releasing a gas is not an observation. You can't, unless the gas is colored, you're not going to see it. It's invisible. You see fizzing. So you can say, I saw or see effervescence. That's okay. But you would never say effervescence is released. Because you're saying fizzing is released. That, that's not correct. Gas is released. So those two things need to be separated. So I've tried my best to kind of show you the, the differences there with oxygen and to make it really clear about the observations. Please note that potassium fizzes, this fizzing, a correct observation. We see floats. It also floats. All of these do. We then see a sphere form in terms of potassium. We see it melt. And then we see, we realize that you've got every single observation that we have seen for sodium. So how is it now going to differ? We're now going to see sparks. We're now going to see a lilac flame. By the way, you can now, now this is one that I'm really, I'm really careful about because they always tend to talk about this idea of motion on the water. And they'll often describe this as it will skate around the surface or dart dart around on surface. 
Now, this is, this is a correct observation, but please, please, please don't ever use it as one of the comparisons. You should never say, oh, potassium darted around more violently or, or more quickly. Once again, this is a, uh, this is an, it's an observation. And unless you're pulling out some way of being able to measure its speed on the surface, it, evanescence, that, that, that's a band, Tiffany. Definitely not the same thing. Um, so don't use the darting. The darting around on the surface is a correct observation. So it can be quoted as one of those. However, please do not, do not use it as one of the comparisons. State how they're different. Um, OK, so we've talked about the reactions with water. I'm really hoping that you guys are going to take the time and watch my nine minute video because I've done all of them in nine minutes. I've been super quick. The next thing to talk about is what we see now with our indicators. Because the, the reactions with water, those are our observations. However, we also, of course, come across a second part, which is not an observation directly. But what now happens is, I shouldn't be doing this in lilac, I should be doing this in black. So if I now add, uh, I, I actually really don't like it being in purple. So I shouldn't do 3D either. So when I put my, let's just do my, my sodium. My sodium forms its circles. We see it effervesce. We see it fizz. Now, at this point, they often comment on testing the water that the reaction has taken place in. So if I were to take this water and I was to take some samples of it, now I'm going to take three different samples of the water. Now, the first thing is, is we know that this was sodium metal. So everyone in this room should be able to give me this equation. Sodium solid is going to react with water. And what it's going to do is it's going to strip off OH and we're going to form sodium hydroxide. Water was a liquid. Sodium hydroxide, of course, is going to be aqueous because it's soluble in water. All the group one compounds are soluble and we're going to have hydrogen gas. And, and by the way, they absolutely love this, uh, love this question because all state symbols are appearing. We can now, of course, balance the equation. Two sodiums, two waters, two sodium hydroxide and one hydrogen. I think that now adds up. Yes, it does. So there's my equation. And what we're now doing is the fizzing is the observation. That's the fizzing being get released as a gas. But we're also now going to test for the sodium hydroxide. So the first thing I'm going to add to this, of course, is universal indicator, UI. Now, the universal indicator, now I made this an emphasis on your mock paper, is going to turn purple, not blue. This is super important. Uh, year 11, super soup. This is going to go purple and not, that is not what I selected. I tried to make that darker purple. Let's go. Oh, I want that one. Oh, that one there. There we go. It's going to go dark purple for sodium hydroxide with universal indicator, hence pH 14. I'm going to now add a second indicator. This is litmus. Now, litmus only has two colors. There's either red litmus or blue litmus. Now, in this case, I'm testing for an alkali, so I'm going to add the red litmus to it rather than the blue. And the reason, of course, is if I add red litmus to this, and I'm going to put this in as a piece of paper, this is my red litmus paper. <laughs> and as that goes into the water, what we're going to see is we're going to see it turn blue in contact with that water. Not purple, because litmus doesn't give the purple color, it only gives blue. The next indicator I'm going to add to this is I'm going to add phenol phalene. Now, this is, of course, the one I've got to phenol, P H T H L E I N. Phenol phalene. This is the one that you guys have used, of course, in your titration practicals. And this one is colorless. This is tricky. It's colorless in acid, but it's then bright pink, illuminescent pink in alkali. So when I add this to the alkali, we're going to see it turn pink. They love all of these, all of these indicators you are to know. Just you know what? I'm gonna do one more. Wink it had a go at me today for saying that I hadn't gone through this with him, or at least I think it was Wink it. No, maybe it was Johan saying that I hadn't done it in class. We are fallible, we are human beings. The last one I'm going to add to this is I'm going to add methyl orange. Now, methyl orange appeared in your mock. Methyl orange is an indicator that is only used in one place. Uh, can you just say pink? Yes, for phenolphthalein, you can say pink. I like Barbie pink, but pink is the right answer. Um, methyl orange is yellow in, in alkali. It is red in acid. 
and it is orange at neutral. So whenever you do a titration, you're looking to hit orange. This is me. I'm trying to change the color on my, on my tablet. There we go. So it's orange when it's neutral, often what you're looking for in a titration. Barbie pink or bright pink, I believe, is better. Bright, bright pink is better. So I'm, not, that way. I'm just going to add a little bit of detail on here. Methyl orange and acid is red. Nice to link that to universal. And it is, uh, it is uh, yellow in alkali. So we know what we're going to see here. You add methyl orange and we see it turn yellow. So all the indicators can be used here for this demonstration. And of course, this is what a wonderful test that they can use at GCSE. Select any one of them and check that you know your indicator. Um, the most common ones, of course, to focus on are going to be your universal. And well, litmus probably appears more than phenolphthalein. But in fact, those three are your key ones to know for this particular demonstration. So all of these do this. It's nice to realize in chemistry, I teach chemistry because it's easy, because there are patterns. If I do the same reaction with lithium, I still form lithium hydroxide and then I form hydrogen gas. Same balancing appearing makes my life easier. Same state symbols. Let's go for potassium. Same thing with water. This time, oop, this time I'm going to form potassium hydroxide and hydrogen. Same balancing, but this time, of course, it's going to be far more balanced. And they often ask at this point, Explain why potassium, sodium, or lithium, and you can, if they say, if they describe this, flames, explain why you see a flame. And the reason, of course, being is you're making hydrogen gas in every single one of these. And hydrogen gas has one problem. It's explosive. So we're going to be saying that the hydrogen gas is explosive or flammable, and we see it then, of course, burn if the temperature is hot enough. But for this demonstration, the only one you're going to see it happen with is potassium, not lithium or sodium. So that takes us to the reactions with water. Dropping into the next one. So we've done water. Let's now drop into our reactions with oxygen. So this is now the reaction with oxygen. So with O2. So this is often seen in a gas jar. There's my gas jar. We often add to this a, what's called a deflic... Oh. Um, a deflocating spoon. This is like a funny little metal hood with a little floaty and it's got a little spoon on the end of it. And this hangs with a little cork that stops it up here. And I put my metal inside here and I fill the jar with oxygen gas. And of course, what you then do is you light the sodium outside and you drop it into the flask. Often you have water at the bottom of this, um, of this vessel. Now, what's going to happen is the sodium, we're going to light it first, the sodium metal, I shouldn't do it there because I think it's a bit ambiguous. I'm going to have sodium metal is going to react with oxygen gas. Now, please, folks, please, please, please. Oxygen is diatomic. Oh, Connor, do we have to spell ph phenol failing correctly in the exam? I think litmus is important since Mr. Di emphasizes it a lot uh, in the exam. Phenol failing, okay, Connor. They, they will forgive you for the spelling as long as it's recognizable. I, I would recommend knowing it. It comes up on a regular basis. But if you ignored the pH, the, the, the pH in the name, they really won't care all that much. Um, I think it is as long as the examiner understands that's correct. Yes. If you spell it ridiculously badly, they will go, that's ridiculous, and mark you down. But if it looks reasonable, they'll give it to you. So the sodium is going to react with oxygen. And the key thing here, folks, is that I cannot stress enough formulae year 11 every one of you is sitting there going yeah, I would have done that that is the most common garbage answer at GCSE everyone just does it as NaO and it isn't it is Na2O and the equation is going to need balancing two two oxygens two oxygens four sodiums now at this point note my state symbol yeah, the state symbol, uh, oh, check this out. The state symbol is solid. Now, this is why one of the obs observations, the obs you're going to see is you're going to see white smoke streaming off this, white smoke. And by the way, smoke is a solid. Yeah, any smoke is a solid. Just um, in class, and have me spelled it over and over in class. Yeah, exactly. Let's do that. So any smoke is a solid. So we see white smoke here. And that white smoke is, I'm going to put, is sodium oxide. And sodium oxide is a solid at this temperature because it's ionic. Melting point for sodium, ion, uh, sodium oxide, well, it's going to be really high. 
it's going to be it's going to be higher than sodium chloride. We're going to I'm going to make a stab in the dark. Sodium chloride is 80, 801. Sodium oxide I'm going to put at around about 1003. Should we check? It's always nice to for me. I, I love playing games with melting points. So let's do sodium oxide melting point. Oh, I wasn't that far off. 1001. I think I said 1003, 1002. 1001 for sodium oxide. What? Oh, that is why I hate the internet. That is terrible, terrible chemistry. There are no, this is ionic, guys, not covalent. That's what gets you into trouble if you Google that kind of thing. So, anyway, sodium oxide melting point 1100 Celsius. So that's going to, I'm just going to put it roughly, melting MPT, that is going to stream off as a solid. The next observation is not only are you going to see a yellow, white, white smoke, you're going to see our yellow flame, our sun yellow sodium flame. This is our sun yellow flame, sun yellow flame. And this, of course, is the flame test. Now, people, of course, are going to say the flame test is the salt. Na1 plus is going to give us our yellow flame. It is, it's picking up the ion. With, if it's not an ion, it won't give the color. So yellow, yellow flame, and that's due to the ion. Please don't forget that, year 11. If they ask you what's causing a flame test, please, please remember to give it a charge. The next thing is this white smoke, this white smoke is going to fill this chamber. And it's going to come into contact with the water. Now, the water, of course, it's going to react with the sodium oxide. Now, this is where it's dropping into periodicity from GCSE. Metal oxides, metal oxides are basic. They're bases. So, and the reason why is that sodium oxide will react with water to form sodium hydroxide. I can balance it with a two, and I'm pretty sure I'm done. That's it. So what happens is, what they tend to do is, they tend to add universal indicator at the bottom. Now, the universal indicator was, of course, green at the beginning, but then on the surface where it comes in contact with the sodium oxide, you see it turn purple. And this is a common question. I'm just going to say, explain the observation with the universal indicator in the bottom of the jar. And the reason, of course, will be is the fact that it is the sodium oxide, number one, is a base, and it's forming an alkali solution with the water. If I burn a non-metal, it'll be acidic. So that'll probably come on another webinar later on. Now, that brings us to the end of my, of my reactions. I'm done. Properties done. Reactions done. I've described the water demo. I've described the oxygen demo. I haven't described the chlorine one. It does every now and again appear. Um, just to tell you that the chlorine one is rather a fascinating one. It's the same. It's another gas jar demonstration with our deflocating spoon hanging down. And this time we get exactly the same observations. We have our sodium metal here. But this time the jar is filled with a pale green gas, which, of course, all of us recognize. By the way, they're often described as yellow, a pale green or light yellow gas. And that, of course, is chlorine. So we have a pale green gas there, which is Cl2 gas. And then what happens, we get our sun yellow flame off the sodium. Once exactly the same thing, reason being is we see the sun yellow flame because we're still getting sodium one plus ions. We still get our smoke. We get white smoke. The green gas will fade. That will disappear. And of course, we fill the gas jar with so with with sodium chloride so this whole gas or the green color fades and of course the reaction sodium plus chlorine gas goes to sodium chloride solid so we've got solid metal reacting with chlorine gas forming a white ionic solid all ionics are solids to melt them require epic amounts of heat epic temperatures once again balance the equation it's a lovely demonstration to do. I'm happy if anybody wants me to demonstrate any of these practicals, I will happily give you a lunchtime to do them and show you them firsthand. But it's a lovely demonstration because the green color fades as the chlorine is used up. The reaction ends, of course, when either the sodium, um, when either the sodium or the chlorine is used up and expires. Um, uh, so that brings us to the end of that. Right. 
We are now 45 minutes into the webinar. We're now gonna look at those exam questions that you guys did with your preliminary. So I set you guys five questions as exam questions and here they are. I have done them with you. So, by the way, isn't that a lovely thing? We're seeing our chlorine demo making an appearance in the very first question. This question is about group one and group seven. It's given us potassium, I'm gonna highlight potassium. Potassium is added to water, colorless solution, and then they changed it to potassium chloride solution. Heat in a gas, and there's our gas. And of course, heating it in a gas, there's our pale green gas appearing. And of course, we know this because the potassium is becoming potassium chloride. So the pale green gas is chlorine. By the way, just to emphasize, I spotted in the question, it said name. So those people who put CL2, you're immediately gonna lose it. Do watch out, folks. If they say name, please give a name. Formulae, CL2, state symbol G, yeah. Next, so chlorine gas, colorless solution, right. There's our water demonstration. We're adding sodium, pot uh, sorry, potassium to H2O, and we're going to be forming potassium hydroxide and giving off, of course, hydrogen gas in the process. At the end of that, of course, we have an alkali solution. So we're then doing a neutralization, and we're then, of course, neutralizing it, neutralization, and we're adding an acid, and the acid, of course, must be HCl. So potassium hydroxide and the acid, again, if, the, do you know what? What a horrendous thing it would have been if someone had done that. You would have just lost three marks in three seconds. If it says name, yet you're not allowed to do it, Donna. No. If you put HCl, you'll lose it. It says name. You must name it. And the answer is hydrochloric acid because it's in a solution. So be careful, Dana. It's one of the key things in the exams, exam technique. Highlight those key words. So I, under, I highlighted it. I'd circle it in the exam. I'd be going, name. Okay, next thing, write an equation. Notice they've dropped us into, ach, they've dropped us into a clever question where all of a sudden they've been talking about chloride, 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 chloride in, in part A and then drop you into iodine. So sodium with iodine. Once again, same equation, two and A's plus, let's give some state symbols. Sodium, of course, is going to be a solid because it's a metal. Iodine is the only group one uh, element that's going to be a solid. And our ionic sodium iodide is also going to be a solid as well. Please note the formulae. Yeah, NAI. Yeah, because the reason being is we've got Na plus one and I one minus. So they're going to cancel each other out. We're going to have NAI. So sodium iodide is our salt. Next. How do you test for iodide ions? We've dropped into group seven here, folks, rather than group one. So it's, I can't separate these. These are real exam questions. I haven't pulled these out. This is actually part of the group seven. I will happily, by the way, this is the hardest group at GCSE and probably A-level as well. And group seven is tough. Test for group seven, of course, is for chloride, bromide, and iodide is you add nitric acid to remove impurities and follow it up with silver nitrate. And the observation for, for the iodide ion. Oh, have I just, guys, I've made a mistake. Look at that. I'm an, I've been a teacher for 12 years and I can even make mistakes. I always like that because, guys, look, it's not, that's wrong. I'm incorrect. It was the test for iodide ions. I've absolutely stuffed that up. The iodide ions do not form a white precipitate, they form. White's wrong. It should have been a yellow. A yellow precipitate, and I haven't made silver chloride. I made silver iodide. That's what, just to drop you into ionic, the silver ion reacts with the iodide ion to form AGI, which is yellow. Just to now talk, tell you, silver chloride, of course, is a white solid. That one's white, followed by silver bromide, which, of course, is a nut. They're all solids. This is cream followed by silver iodide solid, which is yellow. So they get darker. I love the fact that group one do everything there, follows suit. They get darker doing, going down the group, fluorine being pale yellow, chlorine being pale, being green, uh, bromine being brown, and iodine being black. They're getting darker as we move down. So do the precipitates with silver nitrate. So I've, I've made a mistake, guys. Everybody can make mistakes. In exam conditions, it can be done. So I did an extension on this. There is a confirmation. Oh. So I've, I've got that wrong as well. Confirmation, of course, is incorrect now. Silver iodide does not redissolve on any situation with ammonia. So the confirmation is to add conch ammonia and it stays, it remains. 
So ignore that. Let's delete. Delete, delete. delete. No, I don't like it. I'm not going to delete it. I'm just going to say that's incorrect now. Okay, on to question number two. Multiple choice. So question number two is about group work. So we've got 10 minutes. I'm going to finish these questions in 10 minutes. Guys, we're done in one hour. That means I've done an entire revision session all in an hour. Done a crash course plus exam questions. So, okay. So it said, which of the statements is correct? Circle correct in your exam. Right. I went through all of them. It is a good conductor of, elect of electricity. Yes, absolutely. It forms an acidic oxide. No. We know we, we spotted that from our reactions with oxygen. It forms a basic oxide. That's wrong. It is a poor conductor of electric, electrical. Uh, 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 it's a poor electrical conductor. No, it's wrong. It's an acidic oxide. No, both wrong in that case. It's a good electrical conductor. Yes, that is now correct. And it forms a basic oxide. Yes, that is correct. So C is going to be my choice there. I'm done. There's my answer in the exam. If it says that, uh, kind of, oh yeah, okay, next. Uh, right, observations, of course, making an appearance. You can see all my additional notes here. S a small note, small. A small piece of sodium is added to a large trough of water. State two observations that could be made. Float, float, and fizz. Top answers. Right, list of observations. Float, melts, forms a sphere, moves around on the surface, disappears over time. Five observations we need to be able to list. Right, discuss list principle. First thing I thought I'd do is, guys, it says give two observations. Lots of students like to list them. Floats, fizz, uh, melts. If you do this, they will mark the first one and ignore the rest. And if you've then copied that one down there, they'll also ignore that as well. Oh, actually, no, that's probably not true. Get smaller, Donna, they'll allow it. They will allow that, yes. It will get smaller, it is allowed. Next, ignore sparks and flames. Guys. This is, I mentioned this before, sodium does not spark or flame on a small piece. You have to add large pieces that you would never do in a laboratory setting. That would be a ridiculous waste of sodium metal that's extremely expensive. You only add small pieces for these demos. It becomes far too dangerous. Next, on to the next one. So I gave them a top two, floats and physics. State symbols appearing, gotta love that equation. We've got liquid water, aqueous sodium hydroxide, gaseous hydrogen. They love this question, guys, because every single state symbol is there, all of them. By the way, the one, of course, that everyone trips up on is the aqueous. People often think that water is aqueous. It's not. Water is always L, always L in an equation. Can't have aqueous water, water in water. But, um, yeah, the only ones that will ever appear there as solids are your precipitates. So watch out for that in group seven. Next, potassium reacts in a similar way, but is more reactive. State one observation, one observation. That, me, that would be made, the sm that is different, that is not observed with sodium. I immediately dropped into my lilac flame. List of others, sparks and darts was allowed. Darts, but, but the problem is, guys, I don't like that one because sodium darts around as well. And so I genuinely, please don't use it. Darting is one of the ones that you shouldn't, should avoid. So sparks and lilac flame. Ignore more vigorous. Please remember. To be able to comment on something's ferocity or, I don't know, vigorosity, <laughs> don't even think that's a word, but how voracious something is, it's purely, it, it's, it's down to the observer, so it's not quantifiable, so please don't okay. use it. Lots of people use it as well. Very common at GCSE. Explain why, explain why the element in group one have similar reactivities, all have one electron in their outer shell. We know that the three parts of an atom then we've got protons, neutrons, electrons, protons decide who is lilac needed. Yes, it is lilac is, oh, if you say a flame, they'd probably give you that. They'd probably, Tiffany, they'd probably allow just a flame. I'd avoid it because the flame is lilac. Give detail, know your chemistry. You want the examiner to love you. They want, you want the examiner to read your answers and go, oh, someone who has good chemistry. Give the detail if you can give it. Next, right, by the way, Group one, all one electron, all similar reactivity. Group seven, seven electrons, all seven electrons in the large shell, similar reactivity. The electrons decide your reactivity, and it's the quantity in the outer shell that matters. Next, question number three. This question is by element of group one. Um, which statement is correct? Circle correct. Lithium is a non-metal. No, no. Lithium forms a sulfate with a formula. Right, first one that's going to trip people up. 
because people are going to go, I, 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 I don't know. I, I really have no idea if that's going to be like that or not. So I can tell you, lithium plus one, sulfate SO4, two minus, year 11. You must learn your ions, please. This is one of the most important things in chemistry. Just learn them. Crossing down, I'm going to need two, two, two lithiums to cancel that minus charge. Li2SO4. So there's the correct formula. So that one is also incorrect. Lithium reacts with water to form an alkali. Spot on. Lithium reacts with water to form a white precipitate? No, that definitely doesn't happen. So lithium forms a colorless solution. So we'll, we can ignore that one as well. Next, lithium and potassium have similar chemical properties because their atoms have the same number of electrons in their outer shell. First one, isn't that nice when you hit the first one and go, oh, it's a winner. But let's just check the rest. Have the same number of protons? No. If you've got the same protons, you're the same element. That would be lithium and lithium, sodium and sodium. Definitely not. Have two electrons in their first shell? Ooh. That's interesting. Lithium and potassium have similar chemi uh, similar chemical properties. Which shell? That's, you know what? I had to, I had to blink then. I had, I had to pause. Guys, which electrons matter? The only ones that matter are the ones on the outer shell. They're the only ones we care about. The fact that they have the same two in their first shell, doesn't matter, it's not C. Form positive ions. Well, that is actually also true, but it has nothing to do with explaining the similarity in chemical properties. The fact that they form positive ions have nothing to do with it. Once they've formed a positive ion, they are stable and become unreactive. Hence why you can eat salt. Clever question that, that's gonna trip up. I'm really, that question, you would pray as a teacher that students will land on the first one and stop because otherwise they're gonna end up in trouble. That's an overthought question where students would change it on a, when they're reading through a paper and, and then change their minds. The only ones that affect the reactivity are the outermost. Next, lithium potassium have similar chemical properties. State one observation that would be similar for each element and one that would be different. Right, both react with water to produce bubbles of hydrogen gas. So I've, what I've done is here, I've stated, it says, state one observation, yeah, for each element. Well, you've got to put it into the settings. So I had to say, both react with water, both bubble with hydrogen gas. And the, by the way, where's my mark? They're both going to produce bubbles. They're both going to fizz. Sit there, an observation that's similar, right? How are they going to be different? Potassium reacts more violently. I have still not got the mark. Where's the mark? Um, it's more violent than lithium, often producing a lilac flame. So we're recognizing becomes dull when contact with oxygen. They Oh, that's interesting. Let's look back. State one observation that would be similar for each element and one that would be different. Both become dull when contact with oxygen. Ah, oh, okay, Donna. Do you know why I'd, avo I'd avoid it? I can show you why I'd avoid that. Because look, right, these are the metals in their oils, but they've all been put into oil after they've reacted with oxygen. Do you notice that the lithium has darkened? That's become, oh, you've used the word dull. Dull's actually, a, it's all, I, I almost want to give you it, Donna. Because the sodium, that one's become darker. This one's become whiter. It's formed a very, very clear white oxide on the surface. So, but you're right, they do become dull. Do you know what? I'd like to say, Donna, your answer is good. And I'd like to think that a marker would give you good chemistry there. They both do become dull. But I'd avoid it. It's a very, very niche. It's not niche. It's correct. It's, I'd give it you. You can have it. Don't know if you get it in an exam. God, what did the mark scheme say? I'd love to check for that one. Next. Okay. Suggest the formula. Suggest the formula of the compound formed with oxygen. They're testing your formula, folks. K2O. K. Oh, K plus 1. O2 minus. Cross and down. K2O, KCl, K plus 1, Cl1 minus, crossing down, KCl. 
Next, same appearance of state symbols. Right, sneakiest question on the paper. Question, we're nearly at the end now, guys. Two more questions, I'll be really quick, I promise. Sneakiest question on the paper. Hardest one, too. Still got 11 people watching, we're doing well. So they didn't give us the total mass. This was really clever. They gave us two isotopes. Notice the proton numbers are the same, but then neutron numbers are different. But then it told you the percentages. It didn't add them up. You had to do those two first. Sneaky, sneaky question. Seven, 37 plus 48 gives us a mass of 85. 37 plus 50 gives us 87. Times them by the percentages, divide them all by, add them together and divide by 100, and we get an average of 85.6. And of course, how people often go, how do you check? If you go to the periodic table, folks, periodic table, and you find rubidium, what's rubidium's number? Rubidium's number is number 85. There it is. And because rubidium's number is 85, I'm going to be near that. And so 85.6 was, uh, was good. Next. Clever question, though. Cleverest one on the paper. Next one. Uh, I love this one. Because, guys, I know I've gone over by one minute on my hour. The sodium floats on water. It reacts to produce bubbles. State two other observations. They deleted our top answers melts and forms a sphere others moves around on the surface or disappears any one of those four will give you a good answer we'll give you the marks so nice to see it i love them removing the top two how many students go oh but they're the two that i learned oh no do watch out on yorkshire oh no okay nice equation yeah two marks how to balance how to use your state symbols the same equation appearing every time State why they have similar properties. They both have one electron in their outer shell. Place the elements in order of their reactivity. Most reactive, potassium, least reactive, lithium. These are now easy, folks. If you've got any problems with these, I'm happy to talk you through them a bit more closely. Next, two observations again. Notice I'm talking this one here. State two observations that could be made when a small piece is added to a large one. So this is sodium. Yeah, mention lithium. Lithium does not form the sphere. So watch out for that one. Sodium does, so I'm allowed to use that one in sodium situation. Next, which element, right? In another experiment, she added a small piece of a different group one and noticed that the reaction was less vigorous. Which one was it? I had to go back to the question, spot that it was sodium and realize that the less reactive is gonna be lithium. Next, identify the gas that burned. I mentioned that in the discussion of the practical hydrogen because it's explosive or flammable. Give the formula of the ion that causes the lilac flame. K plus not K. Notice it says in the question, you need the ion. Next, right, on my last question, question number five, technically the hardest one on it, asks you to discuss reactivity. And look, notice what I've highlighted. Explain by referring to the electronic structure. We had to mention these guys. We had to mention 281 versus 2881. So I, I immediately, the first thing I did was quote their electronic configurations. Sodium has two in the first, eight in the second, one in the outer. Potassium, 2881. Potassium's outermost electron is further from the nucleus. Notice I've dropped into my routine. Both sodium and potassium will lose their outermost electron when they're in the reaction. Potassium's outermost electron is less attractive to the nucleus. Potassium's outermost electron will be lost more easily. And that brings us to the end of our group one uh, crash course. Year 11, I hope you found it really useful. Um, right, you guys have now got another booklet to do. Again, only five questions, a follow-up booklet that's hopefully gonna, hopefully gonna be showing improvement in your results. So have a go at those, those follow-up questions. And if you've got any more questions, don't, don't hesitate to come and find me in school. It's been an absolute pleasure to see you guys. Uh, I'm going to drop back onto my screen. Let's see if I can get my computer screen back up. Let's go back to this. Cancel my share if I can. Uh, eek, hang on. Uh, share screen, turn off. I'm back. Hey, we're there. You 11, it's been an absolute pleasure. I hope you guys have a nice evening. Thanks for staying and watching the 10 people who made it through.
Donna, you are so very welcome. Amira, you're very welcome. Connor, thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate it, guys. I know it's late on, on a Tuesday, but I really do feel like these are worthwhile doing, and I will see you guys next Tuesday for our next one. Okay, guys. Oh, and go onto my YouTube um, channel and watch that video of me doing all the reactions in nine minutes. Thanks, guys. Have a nice evening. See you later.